Hello, my name is Jay Pyong from Seoul, Korea. Today I would like to talk to you about freestyle propeller flaps. Uh, basically, what freestyle propeller flaps are is a local flap that is based on a single pedicle. However, by using a handheld Doppler or an ultrasound, you try to find the best possible puff rater that is going into the local flap. And then based on that uh, puff rater, design the local flap accordingly to cover the defect by rotating that puff rater flap like a propeller flap. So this is what I'm going to be talking about today. So before we go in to talk about the technical aspects and my personal technical tips in how to do and utilize a propeller flap, let's quickly take a look at the history of how the propeller flap came to be. Uh, it was introduced by this gentleman here on the, uh, on the right of the photo and to my left, it's Dr. Hayakozuku from Japan in Nippon University. He actually came up with a concept of propeller flaps. He defined it as an island flap that reaches the recipient site through an axial rotation of a flap. And basically, and it's supplied by puff raters in multiple way, uh, nourishing pedicles. And of course, you're rota rotating the skin uh, to a certain degree from 90 to 180. And when possible, the artery of the origin is the puff rater and you actually identify it. So here's a typical illustration where it's rotated 90 degrees, as you can see here, to reach the defect and then the donor site is closed primarily. Now, the first illustration actually shows that you don't have to skeletonize it. You could have a bunch of um, tissue uh, or a bunch of fat, uh, fat um, attached to the pedicle. Uh, some people actually advocate this and say that there's less spasm I do, however, uh, like to more skeletonize the uh, puff rater so I could actually see when I rotate and see if there's any um, twisting or actually any um, bented or dented part of the puff rater itself. So I like to use the skeletonized approach. Again, 90 degrees, 180 degrees. And in sometimes, as you can see in the third illustration, if the flap's too large and if you think that there is a, a lack of venous drainage, then you could also supercharge it as seen in this uh, picture here. So the basic idea here is to reach, uh, to reach this uh, defect C, um, you put the center of the puff rater and then you design the length of A, which equals to B plus C. And you basically rotate it 180%, 180 degrees and ultimately reach the defect itself. So that is the definition. And let's talk about some technical tips behind this. So the basic idea of doing a freestyle um, puff rater flap is first identify the defect, uh, locate the best possible puff rater near to the defect. Uh, what do you mean by the best possible puff rater is that uh, perhaps it's closer, uh, it's with the best flow and we'll be talking about that later. And then when you identify the puff rater, you design the flap, you elevate the flap and you free up, a, free up the pedicle, make sure that there's no tension and then ultimately rotate the flap. So let's quickly take a look at this video here. So again, using a handheld Doppler to, to uh, near the, uh, the anticipated defect. Uh, in, in our daily practice today, we like to utilize the, uh, the ultrasound. It actually shows us the exact pathway of the puff reader. And in addition to that, it also allows us to measure the flow velocity. Now, once the defect is seen here, uh, you might want to adjust because we've already located multiple puff raters. And when I design, I sort of take into account what kind of design would give me the best possible chance of doing a primary closure. So, uh, and then you also have to think about how is the puff rater, what is the axiality of the puff rater? Here in this design here, we're taking two uh, potential puff raters uh, to make sure that we include in the flap. Uh, and once we've dissected, it, we're gonna then choose one to come up with the best possible rotation. The rotation axis is a little bit over 90 degrees here, as you can see. Uh, before I start elevating the flap, I wanna make sure that I have two nice puff raters within the design. Uh, once I confirm, the next step is for me to actually uh, visually confirm the puff rater going into the flap. Uh, in that case, uh, I could make a small uh, incision on the margin uh, 
uh, to identify the perforator and then followed by another uh, incision. Uh, if I'm very sure about the perforator, then I'll go ahead and I'll elevate one side of the perforator. Uh, in this case here, uh, what I would recommend you to do is that uh, in the margin of the defect, you could actually raise it with a double hook and actually see if there's a nice perforator going in into the flap. Uh, once you've identified that, again, one side incision, or uh, and then you want to identify the perforator, uh, make sure that there's a nice flow going into the flap. So here, uh, we're identifying the first perforator. And then once we've identified the first perforator, as you can see here, uh, then we'll go ahead and identify the other perforator uh, using the, um, the contralateral side uh, incision. Once I'm comfortable with that perforator here, I'll go ahead and elevate the rest of the flap. Remember, when, when you don't find the perforator uh, with the first incision, then you want to keep on continuing elevating the flap until you come to a perforator, because sometimes um, if the perforator is, is somewhere that you did not anticipate, then you have to modify the design. So it's always important to make sure that you identify the perforator and then finalize the design and then uh, elevate the rest of the flap. So here we're identifying the second perforator here. Uh, the elevation itself here is done uh, supra fascially above the deep fascia. Uh, elevating above the deep fascia gives a lot of uh, advantages. For example, uh, you don't have to um, uh, elevate the deep fascia um, uh, and then what, what happens is that you'll be able to stretch out the flap with the deep fascia uh, not attached. Uh, since we think that the first perforator is much better, here you just saw uh, me ligating the, the first perforator. Uh, and then we're elevating the rest of the flap and I'm going toward that first perforator that we found with the in, in initial incision. Uh, and then I'm trying to skeletonize it. Now we'll be talking about the use of the, uh, the ultrasound later, but uh, this perforator actually gave me a flow velocity of around 31, which was far better than the other one. Uh, I wanna make sure that I have a absolutely free perforator. Uh, this is important that you free up the perforator, especially from the deep fascia, because when you rotate, you don't want any kinking. Uh, and then I wanna go in and make sure that I skeletonize underneath the deep fascia as well uh before i start rotating and and because the longer the perforator length the less torsion as you um as you rotate the flap so it's just simple geometry here so um you want to uh free up the perforator uh as much as you can uh to allow uh, minimal torsion so here we're freeing up the perforator uh and then once i'm comfortable uh with the length making sure that there's minimal uh, tension when rotation, uh, then we'll go ahead and rotate the flap and start the closure. Now at this juncture, um, if you're uncomfortable, uh, if you're a little bit worried about the flow, and when you have two perforators, you could actually use a, a vessel clamp and actually check with an ICG, and then make sure which one is dominant, and then go back and, and, and separate uh, and choose the dominant perforator. So here we're testing the rotation. And then quickly using a hand, uh, quickly using a stapler, trying to inset quickly uh, and see if there's no tension, if the puffer is doing okay, what kind of primary closure I could have. And, and this is a quick inset, uh, this is the quick inset uh, using the stapler, uh, as you can see here. Again, the key is that the, the, the puffer reader, absolutely no tension especially in this defect here, when it's near the, um, uh, the hip joint, you wanna make sure that you sort of flex the hip and make sure that even with the hip flexed, that there is no um, tension. So this is after uh, the whole uh, procedure and you can see that it's a little bit fast in the beginning while the patient wakes up, but ultimately uh, it will get better. So again, the main steps uh, is identify the defect size, uh, locate the potential perforators, uh, design the flaps, uh, and, and then uh, you actually uh, identify the perforator visually, finalize the design, and then elevate the flap, uh, free the pedicle, and then finally rotate the pedicle. 
So the definition of the best pufferator here is I like to uh, be as close as possible to the defect because uh, basically then you don't have to elevate a large flap. Um, I want to choose if possible that has that gives me the best physiologic flow. Uh, that is that could be done by using the ultrasound or by actually identifying uh, which has a larger diameter or better pulse. Uh, and then you also want to make sure that the puff raters that's going into the flap uh, has a nice axial pattern, um, a puff rater, uh, which is in conjunction to the concept of puff rhizomes. So here again is a quick, uh, another uh, example of doing a quick propeller flap in, in the pediatric patient here. Remember, this is the knee. Um, it's a vascular tumor. So we're going to quickly excise the vascular tumor. Uh, we've identified two potential puff raters here uh, after excising the defect. Then we're going to start the design uh, based on the puff rater. Now, again, if the puff rater is located near the margin, uh, what you can do is you could actually use that double hook to elevate the skin and then start exploring um, that puff rater without any additional uh, uh, incisions uh, for the flat margin. So here you could see that we didn't actually design any uh, flap, uh, but first, um, and then for these kind of joint lesions, you wanna make sure that you um, know the maximum defect size, especially when the knee is rotated. Uh, in this case here, we're exploring the puff rater going underneath the deep fascia, uh, which, which is just make it much easier when you elevate the puff rater flap underneath the deep fascia, it's much easier to identify the puff rater going in. So we've actually identified the puff rater uh, visually and with a Doppler. And then uh, we're confident that the puff rater is there with a nice pulse and then we'll quickly um, design the flap accordingly, elevate the flap, rotate, uh, and then quickly uh, close it uh, and able to achieve a primary closure. Now, in the previous video, you probably saw me uh, pinching the thigh uh, because pinching will allow me to uh, estimate whether or not I'll be, I'll be able to close this uh, primarily. So giving that quick pinch test will also give you an idea whether or not the donor site could be closed primarily. Uh, this, in this case here, we're elevating the flap above the deep fascia again, but it doesn't really matter. But when you have the deep fascia, it becomes a little bit more bulky and there's a little bit um, potential problem of having a herniation of the muscle. So we like to basically, I like to basically elevate it above the deep fascia. But again, when you do that, you must free up the pedicle or the puff rater going into the flap and you must free the puff rater around the deep fascia. So here again, with a quick uh, around 180 degree rotation, uh, we want to go ahead, inset the flap. And, and this basic procedure just takes around like quickly a 20, 30 minute procedure. And we're able to have a non-tension uh, soft tissue coverage uh, for this defect around the knee. So it really becomes a very handy approach using these kind of a puff rater flap to reconstruct various parts uh, in our body. So I think I've mentioned a few uh, personal tips, but let's dive in a little bit more deeper on how to do uh, these puff rater flaps. Uh, first, I think, uh, you know, you don't have to be bound by anatomy. It's basically freestyle uh, pedicle that is close to the defect. So you don't have to design the flap that large. So I really strongly believe in the freestyle uh, design. Uh, basically taking a Doppler, trying to identify a uh, handle Doppler, trying to identify uh, as much puff raters around the defect, uh, around the potential defect, and then exploring to see which one works the best. Uh, when you design the flap, you have to understand the puff zone concept, um, uh, how the puff raters are oriented, and you want to follow that uh, puff zone to maximize uh, the safety or the circulation of that puff rater when elevated on that uh, on that puff rater uh, for that flap. Um, also, um, I don't know if you saw the first two case, I would like to design it a little bit over because uh, once you uh, elevate the flap, sometimes the flap contracts uh, and then it makes, it, it may give a little bit too much tension. So I like to sort of over design maybe one or two centimeters uh, larger uh, than the actual defect. Uh, I think that really helps to close the wound uh, 
uh, especially in the defect area. Uh, again, pinching is an important part to obtain primary closure and give you an idea how large the flap can be. Uh, whatever happens, this is the most important key. You must have a tension-free pedicle. Um, I like to frequently use multi-lobed designed uh, propeller flaps that allows me to close the donor site a little bit more easier. So here uh, is an example of a uh, propeller flap that we use very commonly in our practice to treat pressure sores of the sacrum. In the past, we used to do VY or bilateral VYs. The problem with this is that uh, the, D, uh, the, the suture line was in the center. And in the center, that's where the highest tension was. And it may increase the chance of, uh, uh, of uh, dehiscence. Uh, so that so thus we had the patient lie down for a prolonged period uh, for a long period of time. But and when the patient starts sitting, uh, that uh, that uh, midline uh, in a suture point uh, is prone to breaking down. But when you do these kind of propeller flaps, you don't have that midline uh, where it's the highest intention. So the dehiscence rate becomes much more lower, and the post-operative complication becomes much lower. And thus, I like to use this kind of um, propeller flap based on the uh, gluteal artery, as you can see here in this design. So again, using the handheld Doppler, identifying the perforator uh, first, one margin approach, identifying the perforator. Once identified, excise the rest of the flap, rotate, make sure that you dissect the perforator long enough to make sure that when it rotates that there's no kinking. So this is why you see that, um, that dissection going underneath the muscle as well. Uh, rotate, inset, and close the donor site primarily. So this has really been working great uh, in regards to the uh, sacral sore. So here we've talked about the first three uh, personal tips. Uh, another uh, personal, uh, here's another case uh, with an infant that is probably less than three months old. I don't know exactly. But anyway, uh, this patient with a meningomyelic seal uh, defect. So we elevate a, uh, a, a, a a uh, propeller flap based on the perforator somewhere from the back, four by six, quickly rotate, uh, and then we're able to close this site uh, primarily. Uh, and this patient doesn't have to have this kind of open defect for a long time. At the same time, doesn't really need to have a big major free flap surgery. A similar approach here, when you see this big defect in the back, uh, this is one of the most troublesome area to do reconstruction. But now with this approach, I rarely need any free flaps. Uh, uh, in addition to the uh, propeller flap, there's also a keystone flap that really allows to close the defect uh, beautifully. You can see that the design is more horizontal because in this part of the body, uh, the, the perforator's orientation is more horizontal. So you want to make that design a little bit more horizontal uh, based on that uh, a perforator. And this is how you close it. Uh, this is how it looks after you close it. Another uh, propeller flap that we use a lot is when uh, there's um, metallic or uh, device exposure, especially after um, a lumbar uh, bone surgery or uh, a backbone surgery. So here you could see that there's a huge, de uh, huge dead space. In this case, we elevate a propeller flap and we deepithelize the whole propeller flap and we obliterate the dead space using this uh, propeller flap, deepithelized propeller flap and we're able to have this kind of nice result without the recurrence of uh, infection. Uh, again, I'd like to try to close the donor site primarily as possible. So here for a larger back defect, again, uh, the design is horizontal uh, according to the uh, pulverosome concept, but we know that uh, this is a big flap. So instead of just taking a single um, a propeller, in this case, we uh, designed a bilobed flap so you could fit in like a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, and then we're able to uh, get primary closure of not only the defect, but also the donor site as well. Uh, again, a very large flap in this case, um, what we do is we basically, again, bilobed, anticipating how the flap would go. Uh, and then uh, we rotated another local flap lower back, again, fitting it like a jigsaw puzzle to get primary closure of uh, not only the defect, but the donor site. And if need be, a third local flap comes into rotation uh, 
and we're able to achieve this kind of primary closure. Uh, you could design these propeller flaps in multiple ways, bilobed. In this case, uh, it's a very long, uh, it's a defect, and the perforator was not near the margin, so uh, it was a little bit more toward uh, the, the, the cephalot, uh, toward uh, the defect. In this case, we had to design a long flap, so we went ahead and designed the long flap and we were able to close this uh, primarily. Uh, but for knee, sometimes, you know, that design doesn't really work well. So you might want to uh, modify this design like a hockey stick uh, design. So we're able to modify these designs instead of having a linear pattern, sort of like an L-shape uh, propeller. Uh, and then we're able to close this defect, uh, not only the defect itself, but also uh, close primarily the donor site as well. Uh, in the arm, we also uh, use... Um, uh, perforator local perforator flaps as well. In this case, uh, we initially designed it as a propeller flap, but um, once we actually elevated uh, the flap, uh, when we rotated, there was a little bit too much tension. So in this case, we were, eight, we were very lucky enough to actually advance this flap based on the perforator. So it was a uh, perforator flap, but it was an advancement VY perforator flap. We had to skeletonize the perforator a little bit more to achieve a tensionless closure. But nevertheless, this is the modification that you could find. Uh, if you're not able to rotate it, or if it's a little bit short, uh, but if you're lucky enough, you have a long uh, pedicle perforator and basically able to do a VY. Uh, same thing for the leg. Uh, for small defects, we're able to have this kind of primary closure and quickly get away with, um, with reconstructing lower one third of the flap as well, instead of doing a free flap. Uh, uh, this is a quick, uh, a small boutique flap for the face, uh, again, nasolabial, it's, it's like a nasolabial artery flap, uh, but again, it's based on a single perforator, rotated 180 degrees, and we're able to have this kind of result. Uh, you could actually do this in the chest as well. Uh, this is a patient with exposed, um, um, exposed device. Uh, um, and after we removed the device and put the port somewhere else, we quickly designed a, a propeller flap, removed that unstable skin, uh, and then have this kind of closure. Uh, when you do have marginal uh, um, congestion, I think leeches come in very well, and we're able to have this kind of closure. Again, for the shoulder region as well, uh, design a quick uh, propeller flap, uh, rotate it 90 degrees, and we're able to have this kind of result even for the shoulder uh, position as well. Um, another personal tip that I think we talked about briefly is for the joints, um, you wanna make sure that uh, you flex the joint as much as possible to understand the defect size, but also at the same time, after you uh, rotate the flap, you want to immobilize uh, the flap for a while uh, because when you uh, move the joint, it may cause tension to the perforator itself, and you want to avoid giving the tension to the perforator. Uh, we talked briefly about the elevation plane. I like to go above the deep fascia, or even in some cases above the superficial fascia, uh, depending on the thickness of the defect. Uh, but if you're able to elevate the flap above the deep fascia, um, it will give you a little bit more extensibility, and you'll be able to stretch out the flap a little bit more, uh, giving you a better coverage. Uh, and also avoid uh, muscle herniation. So when uh, you, it's possible, uh, then you might want to uh, try elevating above the D fascia to utilize these kind of special characters. Again, for smaller flaps, you could supercharge the flap. I mean, for large flaps, you could supercharge the vein. Uh, in some cases, if you think it's more than multiple territories, uh, could even consider uh, supercharging the artery as well. Um, I think we, we, I briefly showed you how to util, utilize the ultrasound in, in uh, propeller flaps. And I, I really want to go in and talk about this. Um, I think one of the, the key um, moments that, that in, our, in my practice that I started to really think about utilizing the ultrasound was when I had to turn the propeller flap 180 degrees. Now you must ask yourself, is one side rotation, like, let's say for example, clockwise rotation, uh, and then there's the 180 degrees counterclockwise rotation. How do you know which one is better? I think for those who have done a lot of propeller flaps, I think sometimes you will see that when you do 180 degrees, 
you know, sometimes it's a little bit, uh, it has a little bit rapid refill while you do the other side, it has a better refill. So how do you explain that? Uh, theoretically, it shouldn't make any difference. So this was the idea uh, that, uh, that we had, and we started to actually measure the flow velocity and the flow volume after rotating the flap 180 degrees each. When we perform the color flaps in our center, so we often see a difference. So, so this is the actual um, a video that was published in, PR, uh, in JRM. Uh, and what we found out was that it actually does make a, a, a statistical difference. So here the design was rotating the flap uh, 180 counter and then 180 counterclockwise and looking at uh, the data. And what we found out was that comparing one side from the other when you're rotating the flap 180 degrees, there is a clinically significant difference of the velocity and the flow volume. So uh, when we looked at our results in the past where we didn't uh, measure and then do flaps uh, and then compared to the ones that we did measure and then take the one with a higher flow velocity and volume, uh, we saw that there was much more, uh, far less um, complications uh, compared to the, the, the flaps that were not, that were not um, selected uh, based on the observation of the ultrasound. Uh, so what does this mean? So it actually means that now uh, we're able to maximize the flow by understanding which side of the rotation is better. And I think this really makes a bigger difference when the flap becomes large. So when you design the flap, sometimes large, um, you see that uh, margin uh, congestions or, or necrosis. But now with this understanding, with better flow and better velocity, we're able to design the flap a little bit large. Uh, and then still um, have a good flow all the way to the tip. So this is when I started to really start to utilize the ultrasound. And since that, um, I have now uh, rarely we use the handheld Doppler. Uh, we always use the ultrasound and we actually also see the, um, the pathway of the perforator itself. We actually could see the diameter of the perforator uh, and, and again, uh, the flow velocity and the flow volume. So this really allows us to understand which perforator is the dominant perforator around that defect uh, and then allows us to design uh, a much more uh, a secure flap. One last quick tip that I want to share with you is getting out of trouble. Now, when you've rotated the flap and maybe after three hours or the next day, you suddenly see flap in uh, some kind of despair. It could be an inflow problem or it could be an outflow problem. So what do we do then? So what I do is I quickly uh, derotate. I open everything up. I derotate, position the flap back where it is, um, and then uh, and see what happens. Because if you leave it when the flap's in trouble, then ultimately the flaps, you're going to lose the flap. But when you derotate, sometimes the flap uh, gets back its uh, flow. Um, and also recovers the outflow. And after a week or two, it's like a delay uh, flap. It's like a delay procedure. And when you see that the flap is in better shape, then after one or couple of weeks, then I rotate back into the defect. And that has really helped me to get out of trouble in using uh, propeller flaps many times. Now, uh, there has been a, uh, since the uh, introduction of this kind of propeller flap um, uh, approach, there has been a huge uh, change in our daily practice. Uh, we rarely do free flaps for the back anymore. It's either keystone or propeller. Again, for the buttock, we never do VY for the sacral sores. It's now all propeller flaps. For the thigh, we never do free flaps. We could do one or two uh, local flaps. And the same thing for perineum, we have sort of glided away from using a lot of the gracilis and now doing a lot of the uh, propeller flaps. This was a paper that we published in microsurgery. We've actually located multiple systems around the perineum. And then uh, you could actually select the right uh, perforator flap to cover multiple defects around the perineum and then really have this kind of like with like coverage um, and again, if not, if one flap is not enough, multiple flaps could really allow you to have the best possible coverage uh, of this region as well. Uh, before I, fi I finish, I quickly want to think about some additional thoughts that I want to share with you today. Uh, what about cancer uh, resection? Uh, 
So one of our cancer um, uh, oncologists, on, uh, uh, surgical oncologist, actually came and said, hey, look, you know, um, with the propeller flaps, you know, he's seen a couple of uh, recurrence in the margin. And we actually did a study looking at the recurrence. And then when you rotate the flap, one of the original margins actually rotates into the donor site. And that's where the recurrence actually occurred. So now uh, we ask our radiation uh, oncologist uh, to make sure that you not only irradiate the field of the original defect, but also the donor site of the propeller flap as well. Uh, but however, when we did uh, look at the actual recurrence rate between the propeller flaps and the free flaps that we did, there was really no um, uh, clinical significance. Um, however, uh, I think talking with your radiation oncologist and making sure that the margin is also radiated, it I think may play a difference in the recurrence. Uh, in diabetic foot, um, if it's a neuropathic diabetic foot, if the patient has great uh, vessels, that's okay. You could just do a uh, local flaps for like any flaps. I mean, for like any uh, lesion. But 70% of the diabetic foot are uh, ischemic. And when you design a local flap uh, or a propeller flap on an ischemic foot, uh, there's a chance that you'll create a bigger defect. So when the defect is, when the foot is ischemic, you wanna make sure that you do the angioplasty, maximize the flow first before you design uh, uh, the, uh, the propeller flap. As you can see here, this patient was initially ischemic. We opened up the vessels. Uh, we realized that the vessels were pretty good after um, reopening the obstruction, more proximal uh, on the leg. Uh, and then we were able to quickly design this kind of propeller flap to, uh, to reconstruct after removing part of his bone and part of the dead tissue. So for ischemic lesions, you wanna make sure that you get that ideal flow first, uh, and then design a local flap to do reconstruction. Um, when you design, you want to respect the axiality uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the flap. Uh, and finally, you know, um, I don't think that, uh, you know, doing a skin graft, um, doing a skin graft, uh, if, it's, if it's not able to close primarily um, is, uh, makes a huge difference. Uh, if you're able to close it primarily, great. Uh, that's the ideal way. But if not, I think taking a small piece of skin graft to close the donor site, um, I think is still a very good approach. So if you can close it primarily, great. You could design it to close it primarily, great. If the patient's getting radiated, then you want to make sure that it's closed primarily. But if not, don't be afraid to do a small piece of uh, skin graft as well. I think in conclusion, a perforator flap, in order to do a good perforator flap, you have to understand the microsurgery principle. I always say this is non-microsurgical microsurgery because you're understanding and utilizing the principle of microsurgery. Uh, it also has a learning curve. You have to know that tips and tricks. You have to respect the axiality of the flap. Uh, and, and finally, I do believe that this is a feasible and a very, very efficient primary option for a lot of uh, reconstruction cases. So with that, that's the talk that I have prepared for you today regarding um, propeller flaps or freestyle propeller flaps and uh, some of my personal technical tips. So with that, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you.